I'm Dr. Duncan Maxwell. Um, I'm the research program lead for Monash University, um, where I also coordinate a research group called the Future Building Initiative, focused on industrialized building. Um, and it's my honor to introduce um, this afternoon's first keynote speaker, um, Jamie Johnston of Bryden Wood. Um, Jamie's a leading voice in the systematization of design and construction. Um, and together with others at Bryden Wood, he's worked to define a platform approach to design for manufacture and assembly, or as they term it, PDFMA. I first became aware of Jamie and his team's work while completing my PhD in 2017, when I was exploring the case for design value in industrialized building platforms. While in parallel, Bryden Wood were publishing delivery platforms for government assets. Since then, Bryden Wood have come to Australia and had the opportunity to engage with Adam and Simon through a number of CRC project activities and events. And Jamie joins us today as the author of four books on platform-based design and construction. And Brian Wood's work has been adopted as a key articulation of the UK government's efforts to industrialize construction. Those efforts have been coordinated through Brian Wood's construction playbook, the contributions to construction playbook, and the contributions into the construction hubs product platform rulebook, as well as contributions to the Royal Institute of British Architects DFMA overlay to the plan of works. As an architect with a passion for industrialization of building and the opportunities that flow for design, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Jamie to the stage for his keynote, an introduction to platform approach to DFMA. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, well, firstly, thanks for inviting me to come and um, present. I'm delighted to get the opportunity to, to talk about the stuff we've been doing in the UK. Um, Helena actually introduced the, top, the um, concept of platforms earlier, so that's sort of saved me a couple of um, slides. So I'll explain what it means to us and how we've been trying to sort of propagate this thinking, particularly in the UK. Um, so for those who haven't come across Brydenwood, we are an integrated design uh, engineering consultancy. So we, that, we use that word integrated really specifically so when we were set up one of the issues we perceived was that the industry thinks in terms of disciplines and sectors and stages so you might be a uh, architect specializing in master planning for residential so that we think is a problem because people are only seeing one small piece of the puzzle so we were deliberately set up to be much more broad in our thinking so we do everything from kind of business case and strategy right the way through to sort of construction logistics as you'll see um, across a whole range of sectors and one of our interests has been taking best practice from one sector and putting it into another which again the industry doesn't doesn't do particularly well so we focus very much on uh, industrialized construction and our thinking the, the sort of physical and digital are completely linked I think certain people in the UK think there's this sort of BIM thing going on there's this DFMA thing going on they're completely linked there's no point having a very advanced construction system and driving it with 2d PDFs for instance um, and the, the, what we stand for, um, I mean, you've, you've heard all the stats today about the you know, productivity and the amount of waste the industry produces, all those sorts of things. Um, our view is that anyone who has anything to contribute to transforming construction like, has a moral duty to get this stuff out there. So that's why we publish so much and we write so much stuff about this. So the UN predicts another 4 billion people, so world population tops out at about 11.5 billion. There is a vast amount of healthcare, housing, road, rail, transport infrastructure that we have to build for the next four billion people. And on Matt's point earlier, it shouldn't just be mm, a bit of housing. Like It needs to be phenomenal social infrastructure for the next, next generation that's coming. Um, <clears throat> so we've been developing lots of systems across uh, a range of sectors, as I said. One of the things, because we're architects, we're very mindful of is clients want very... Uh, bespoke assets, they want to maximise site utilisation, they want to hit a particular brief. Manufacturing wants complete standardisation of everything. So we're constantly trying to solve that tension between standard components and processes and complete freedom of asset design. So that's led us to become much more componentised and granular. So you can see here we've generally been developing sort of kits of parts that have been configured in lots of different ways. So we don't compromise architectural ambition to get the benefits of manufacturing and that's been a real obsession of ours um, this morning Matthew talked about a culture of iteration so we've actually been not inventing new systems 
for two decades. We've actually been evolving systems as we go from sectors. So something we did in pharma will morph into something for secondary education, will morph into something for healthcare, for housing. So we've been on this sort of very um, evolutionary journey for a long time. <clears throat> and Matt also made the point about a culture of patience. Like, we've been pretty patient. We've done this for like two and a half decades, but we're out of patience. It's, it's you know, the clock's ticking. Um, so we started adopting this term platforms about 2017-16, um, particularly in the public sector. We're saying, look, if you look at the amount of stuff we've got to build and just taking the numbers of houses that you aren't building, the idea that you do that project by project, like, that's bullshit. Like, we haven't got time to do that now. Uh, and even the big clients with the sort of big programs don't have enough of a pipeline to adjust the needle. So again, that sort of boom and bust Thing. What we see is in the UK, we build loads of schools, then nothing for a decade, then loads of hospitals, then nothing for a decade. So we started saying you need to find a way to get commonality across those sectors and actually start to develop much more widely applicable solutions. Um, so I started work with the UK government in 2011-12. <clears throat> so when the UK government uh, decided to adopt BIM, I was part of the task group that was responsible for developing and implementing that strategy. So we've been working with the government departments for the best part of a decade now. Um, one of the things that we saw as we moved between departments is that there was, say, on the Ministry of Justice estate, they would have, obviously, house blocks is one of their key typologies, but they would also have education and healthcare and visits and other things, but they wouldn't be talking to the Department for Education or they wouldn't be talking to the Department for Health and Social Care. So we did a thought exercise and said, when you buy a school, you're really buying teaching capability capacity. You're buying teaching spaces to educate kids. When you build a hospital, you're buying inpatient wards and clinical spaces to heal people. So if you plotted everything government buys on this graph of kind of spans and heights, like everything lives on that graph somewhere, <coughs> you could probably start to find commonalities. So again, Everyone tends to focus on why sectors are different and special. We said if you did it the other way and looked at why sectors are the same, you'd find absolutely tons of commonality. So we said, look, typologically, a prison house block and a student accommodation block and single living accommodation for the army aren't actually dissimilar. They're cellular repeatable spaces with a robust residential function, say. Uh, you know, warehouses and sheds aren't dissimilar. So we said you'd start to get this clusters of typologically similar building types. If you enhance that, you could then start to look for common sets of components that would deliver those things. So we guessed, we reckoned about 60, 70% of stuff lives in between the two ends of the spectrum. So person, uh, floor to floor heights are kind of person height plus a bit. At that height, you can get natural light about eight meters into a building that's why teaching spaces and healthcare wards and apartments have a kind of seven, eight metre span, because it's nothing to do with sector, it's because they're all based around people. So we said if you looked for examples like that where there was uh, overlap, you could start to derive like the IKEA kit of parts that would allow you to do construction in a completely different way. <coughs> so we love that I the IKEA analogy because they've taken all furniture and they've boiled it down to literally a handful of interfaces a way of doing a book, a couple of tools, and suddenly like, everyone can make furniture. So furniture used to be very skills-based, trade-based, labor-intensive. Now, probably everyone in this room can make furniture. You go, right, that's a thing. What does that look like for construction? So we started then to have this conversation around, if you could do this, you would suddenly get into a sort of consistent pipeline. So whether you're building schools or hospitals or resi like you'd be using these components suddenly you're buying them at massive scale suddenly you get into the economies of scale that manufacturing likes and all of the you know, continual improvements and lean thinking all of those kind of things um, you could actually start buying components from <clears throat> like loads of different people so you'd start to distribute your supply chain so you'd have all of these benefits that you can't get unless you get into this sort of mindset so it probably has to be government that does it, because they're the only people that have this massive cross-sector pipeline, long-term interest in the assets, and the kind of you know, ability to change the industry to do this, because no other client's body can probably do it. 
Um, <clears throat> so he said, if you did that, this is how you would start to deliver your assets. On the right-hand side, you would have a digital library of the component parts. You would configure them. You wouldn't design things from scratch necessarily. That would allow you then to write uh, machine-readable rules that would describe how the components would go together. That would allow you to start to automate design. And you've seen some examples of that this morning. David's going to show some examples of it a bit later. <clears throat> you know, you would start to transform the design thing and get dramatically faster because, like, you really have to. Uh, on the left-hand side, uh, you could be buying all the components from existing suppliers. So one of our interests having run our own factory for a bit, was how do I not have to have loads of capital investment? So in the UK, lots of people have spent like £100 million on a factory, haven't been able to, to amortise the cost of the factory, they've shut it down. You're going, that's probably not the model that we're pursuing here. So we started looking at, can you make simple components that your existing suppliers can make? So you've lowered the barrier to entry. Suddenly, all those manufacturers, fab shops with downtime could be churning this stuff out in the background and going, I'm just making these things to keep myself busy because we'll need it at some point. Um, and you would then assemble those components. So again, like IKEA, uh, one of my particular interests is can we turn construction into s tasks that are so simple that literally you know, a person off the street can put a building together? Because if we don't do that, because the stats you saw this morning, there's not enough people in construction. Like We've got a massive problem. So... I'm interested in whether we can literally do the IKEA thing and turn construction into very, very straightforward tasks, massively diversify the workforce, because suddenly unemployed prisoners, ex-prisoners, all of those sorts of people could put buildings together. And we've actually built pharma facilities using ex-British Army. We've built um, prototyping for the prisons program is actually done by prisoners in prison. The idea being we would upskill them and train them so they're less likely to re-offend. So this is your kind of um, uh, mental model. And then you start to automate all this stuff. And then, right, now, we, now we're off to the races. So we wrote, um, it's Duncan, so we put the first book out on this in 2017. Deliberately called it um, Delivery Platforms of Government Assets because of the fact we said government has to do it. Wasn't just us, but you can see that language was quite influential, I think, in our federal budget statement 2017, where government first said, we're going to use our spending power to transform construction. You go, right, now we're getting somewhere. Um, there was then a whole series of publications that you can see, and increasingly this language started getting picked up by, like, more and more stickily within sort of government thinking. So the construction playbook, uh, bottom right, was written over lockdown. It's the kind of... Um, 14 policies that should drive all procurement moving forwards. But you can see here they're talking about digitally designed components, standard interfaces, standard components. You know, now we're getting somewhere that this thinking is actually quite uh, firmly embedded in policy and strategy. Um, I led a piece of work, or we did a piece of work at the Construction Innovation Hub that was set up to kind of try and bring this theory to life. So we took the forward pipeline data of these departments... So this is like the real version of that sort of thought exercise scatter graph. Put it all into Uniclass, which was a nightmare, but we could then formally do this cross-typology analysis and actually properly get to the bottom of what is the DNA of the government estate, what might this kit of parts look like. Um, so we found things like a 50 billion we looked at, 35 billion pounds worth of construction could be done with one structural system. So if you had a structural system that worked, you can imagine how good you'd get and how efficiently you'd start building things. Um, we also found things like there's 104 names for toilets in the government estate. So there's loads of potential standardisation, but it's hidden by the fact that every trust, every department has their own nomenclature. That's a problem. And we also found that less than half of a hospital or a school is actually like clinical or teaching space. So most of those building types are... Uh, plant, circulation, waiting, storage, sanitary accommodation, dining facilities. So even the sectors that people think are like special, like less than half the building is actually the function you think it is. So all of this stuff started to, to give us some proper evidence for the scale of the opportunity and what this might look like. Um, so we've been developing, as I say, lots of these systems. We started to converge on uh, a sort of common kit of parts We've started with superstructure, so that's not the biggest bit of anyone's cost plan by miles, but it's the source of everyone's pain. So you can already buy 
like Unisize for SARF, that supply chain's mature. It's been going for decades. So you can already buy things from system houses. Lots of people prefabricate MEP and fit out things. Uh, what we found was that most of the benefit of the manufactured bits gets diluted when it hits like shit normal construction. So you get your millimeter perfect facade turn up and you're trying to bolt it to a wobbly piece of concrete. So the facade um, supply chain we work quite closely with said 40% of their time on site is site surveys, measuring, bracketing, mastic, filling in the gaps basically between their perfect thing and the, the context that it's sitting in. So we said if you had a superstructure that was super fast, super accurate, pre-enabled for all of the other bits, like it's really easily believable that, you know, facade clips on, MEP clips in. So that's where we started with superstructure. Um, so we've got a kit of parts that I'll show you that is literally the same kit of parts we would use across all of those sectors. So education, resi, healthcare, prisons and commercial office <clears throat> and you can see a bit like Ikea some of it's the components so sometimes the, it's the physical bracket is the same a lot of it's the process so the design automation the robotic welding is the same and some of it's the tools so like the lifting equipment and things the same so we have a broad range of components processes interfaces that are exactly the same across all of those sectors um, so it looks a bit like this. You'll see a video in a second of what it looks like going together. I've highlighted that interface, the one with the purple box, because to an operative on site, that is always the same. So it's always the yellow bracket or the red bracket. I always have three bolts and put it together. So we standardize at that kind of interface level. <clears throat> but the same kit of parts we would then configure just slightly differently. So you change the column length, the beam length, and suddenly... The, the operative on site doesn't care what length anything is. He's just into, or he or she is just interested in that interface. So by having the same <coughs> structural components interfaces, you flex certain dimensions, and suddenly the same kit of parts does you all of these use cases. And then you'd also have a kit of parts for the facade. You'd have a kit of parts for the MEP. But again, you can already buy those. So the only slightly unusual thing that we've done is the superstructure and the way we assemble it, everything else you can already buy. So again, we're not needing massive investment. We're not needing a sort of complete shift in the construction. We just focus on one bit. So these are all schemes that we've developed for uh, projects using this kit of parts. So yeah, we've got lots and lots of use cases now for the same set of components. Um, I won't talk too much about this, but you can imagine then we've got the kit of parts. They understand how they relate to each other. So. We don't draw the building or design the building anymore. You plug in some parameters. It auto-generates a data set that describes where all the components are. That generates the BIM model. So the BIM is actually a view of a data set that describes the componentry. And yeah, that's been talked about a bit, bit this morning. Um, for some components, we don't actually draw them now. So we send the model straight to a robot. So you miss out all of the kind of human interpretation, potential for error. The thing the robot makes will be exactly what you drew. It will be always the same, and it will be sub-millimeter accurate. So suddenly, we're now dealing with kits of parts that can be very, very cheaply made. So about 40% of the cost for steel frame is actually the fabrication. So it's the detail design fabrication. We use actually really dumb bits of steel all of the clever goes into the interfaces which are robotically made. So suddenly you're, you're getting much closer to commodity costs, so the cost of your frame suddenly starts to plummet. So you potentially you can take out like 50, 60% of the cost of a, the steel frame. So good start, that's helpful. Um, <clears throat> this is how we, this is our prototyping center. So we're quite weird for architects that we actually have a prototyping center. Um, so this was looking at uh, can you build the entirety of a structural frame without ever working at height? So you stand on the floor, you lift the bits up, you build the next floor, then you stand on that one. But what you can see here is, firstly, very few people measuring things in minutes, simple tasks. Like, honestly, if you watched this video a few times or had a day's training, you could build yourself an office block. Like, no bother. It's really, really straightforward. There's actually there's videos of, of me on YouTube making bits of facade panel using a similar sort of... Um, System. So this was looking at, could we get a tiny number of people, a little bit of automation, uh, <coughs> train them up, and they will get, you know, super, super accurate superstructures. So this has nine-meter bays, 
Uh, on a nine metre bay, we were plus or minus five mil. So on a span from sort of there to there, we are plus or minus five mil. So you know then the facade's going to just go whacking in. You know that the MEP will just go whacking in. All of the MEP fixing points are already cast in that slab. Some of the facade bracketry is already cast in or fixed to the steel. So you know that every following trade has got a much, much easier time of it. Uh, one of the other things to note on this, we're using in situ concrete, which people think is a bit weird sometimes. Um, <clears throat> so actually, because of the laser cutting of things, we can get precast quality but without the cost of a precast factory. So again, manufacturing wants to get close to commodity costs. So we literally get raw concrete, it's touched once, and it's a building. Whereas a precast factory does that, then moves it, lifts it, cures it, lifts it, puts it, hoits it into the building. And precast is about six times the cost of raw concrete. We're at, you know, getting close to commodity cost. Um, so this is the, the first project. Yeah, yeah, this is the first project where we actually deployed this. Um, this was for a company called Landsec, UK's biggest private developer. So again, something interesting about the fact that a private developer with a, who are very commercially driven have done this project. So it was talked about earlier that the first one's more expensive. This one was at least cost neutral, very site specifically designed, but total kit of parts. Um, so we literally picked up the kit of parts we did for the prisons, added one component to get bigger spans. Suddenly it's good for commercial office. Uh, one of the benefits, because of the optimization of the components and the material spec, we took about 30% of the embodied carbon out. Um, virtually no waste, because the kit of parts turns up, you only bring the things you need. Massively controlled logistics, so you get all of these kind of additional benefits from doing this. Uh, University of Cambridge crawled all over this and looked at, on this graph, productivity is the y-axis, uh, speed is the x-axis. So the orange dots are precast. So that's about the best technology we've got. Uh, it's about the most productive thing we've got. On its first outing in COVID with supply chain problems, we were about twice as productive. So like day one, we smashed productivity. And you go, right now, let's get faster doing it. Uh, I'm going to zip through these, Duncan. I know you're... <laughs> uh, so I talked about that sort of enabling thing. So the facade suppliers weren't weird. They came to the prototyping centre, they practised putting the facade up. They gave us a 40% reduction in cost for no other reason than it was super accurate and said, yeah, I just won't price all the pissing about that I normally do on site. Um, the Gantt chart said seven panels a day was about industry best practice. At peak, they were putting them in one every six minutes. So a thing that was supposed to take an hour was taking six minutes, but no one believed that before. So one morning they did 19 an hour and a half and went, you know, back in like four weeks, we're just going to go and make some more. So they were very quick, but they weren't. So theoretically, you could have clad this building in a week, but no one believed that at the time. Um, <clears throat> our MEP supplier then set up benches in his factory, <coughs> had a teams of people dropping all of the MEP onto these cassettes. They would stack up a series of cassettes wheel those out onto a truck, wheel those onto a floor plate, and what you can see there is a, a forklift with a special end effect. So they'd lift up five, six, seven cassettes, hoik them up, turn the buckle, next one, fix it up. So a team of two people just tore through the building, putting all the MEP up. Looks amazing. Like That looks like a you know, very, very well coordinated piece of kit. Um, these were the install times. So when they started, they used a thing called genie lifts. When they got the hang of the forklifts, install time literally collapsed, and two people could just belt through a floor plate. Um, and because of the close integration I talked about earlier, we have three and a half meter floor to floor heights, which is mental for London office. But it means that in an 11 story, in a 10 story normal planning volume, we can get 11 stories. So if you're a commercial developer, like that's gold dust, that's just a phenomenal result. Or we just have less building volume and therefore less air to heat and treat and therefore smaller pumps and smaller fans and smaller running costs. And you get, again, this sort of chain reaction of um, super benefits. So last couple of things for me. Um, the, the Cambridge data was amazing, actually, but it showed that uh, the system allowed you to go very fast, but because of the kind of normal construction logistics, they weren't optimising things. So if you took not the fastest rates they did, but like the 75% rates, so rates they've already achieved, but you did it consistently, you would smash the programme. You'd take 40% out of the programmes. So they did this analysis and showed that 
without going any quicker than they already did on, on project one, next time if we did it more consistently, you would literally nearly halve the program. So you go, well, that's quite interesting. We've smashed productivity, smashed program. If you did that, that's where the productivity dots would be in that top right corner. So we know now how to double productivity, get massive speed. The opportunity, obviously, is to scale that by the size of the government pipeline and oof, there we go, construction, transform for everyone's benefit. So there's, you know, we're not there yet. There's lots to do. We'll talk about them in a bit. Uh, if you go on our website, there's tons of information. There's all the books we've published. There's all the apps. There's a whole load of stuff if you want to read more about it. And I will stop now. Thank you for listening. <laughs>
we learned a very, very valuable lesson that maybe wasn't the lesson that they intended to teach us, which is people who build technology really should talk to their customers first. And don't build technology before you speak to some people about it. We built an algorithm that would save significant waste, and the reaction devastated us. Mm. And we're like, oh, that's a bit wasteful, isn't it, in itself? Um, mm. So we really should be speaking to these people first. And I think you know, the fact that, that myself and Jamie have discussed this at length is exactly a learning process for us on top of that. OK. And Jamie, you get to have the last word. What did you learn about this that you didn't expect you would learn or you know, just as you've gone through your process um, of you know, writing those books, working through all of this, was there something where you went, well, I wasn't <laughs> expecting that? Uh, I think one of the most interesting things actually was the reaction of the lower tiers. So because we went straight to the supply chain for the you know, facade and the MEP and things, it was like they've been waiting for someone to ask this question like for ages, they're going, oh, finally, someone... Because normally the way we procure things, by the time the package of information arrives at them, they're going, if you'd asked me this two years ago, I'd have told you not to do that, I wouldn't have done that, I'd reorganise that, but it's too late by the time they get hold of it. So the opportunity to go and st straight to them, share with them what we were doing, and them going, no, no, we're completely... We've got some thoughts around this, actually. So that, again, is a, uh, I think, interesting thing. The business model in the, of the GCs... Mm. isn't set up to do this. The lower tiers are definitely there. I think there's some really interesting opportunities, but the business model that sits in the middle, which is normally the, the gatekeeper, so Landsec, we're going talking directly to supply chain. That's really weird for Landsec, because the normal gatekeeper is the tier one who then manages that. That is a potential blocker, because there's quite a lot to do in terms of what is the new value proposition for GCs and tier ones. That, I think, is a big big conversation that we need to, need to have. Fantastic. And... Thank you. I mean, I think we should all put our hands together for a big thank you.